The character role-playing game has made an unlikely comeback. In a landscape dominated by so-called live service experiences, where developers try to retain players indefinitely with recurring gameplay loops and a continual trickle of content, it would have been difficult to see the quintessential single-player narrative-driven experience take center stage. But that's exactly what's happened. The surprise success of Baldur's Gate 3 tells us that the modern gamer is craving a rich, curated experience, where their actions carry agency and meaning. Enter Dragon's Dogma 2, a game carrying that classic CRPG DNA, stirring memories of the Gothic series and even Ultima's later third-person iterations. Dragon's Dogma 2 epitomizes those classic characteristics, both good and bad. Those games were marked by rich open worlds and stories placing the protagonist center stage as part of some world-altering cataclysm. These worlds also happen to be packed with rewards situated off the beaten path and... Treasure chests! Oh, so many treasure chests. How best to proceed. The fairy. A fine thing, this. Oh, that last one was live action footage of a steak being cooked on cast iron. Yeah. Did I mention this was a Japanese game? What typifies them is an assortment of janky mechanics, which can be annoying as much as they are endearing. Clunky movement, inconsistent targeting, odd ledge grappling, player characters suddenly leaping off cliffs to their untimely demise. Broken quests, the works. Dragon's Dogma 2 takes both the best and worst of these characteristics and much like the original, unashamedly amplifies them. Much has been made of Dragon's Dogma 2's launch controversy. Excessive launch day microtransactions and performance that would have made even Crisis blush back in its time. Yet, after 100 hours and a full playthrough of the main game, the hidden post game section, and now well into New Game Plus, I've been able to put all of this into context alongside the game's broader scope. So let's dive in and retrospectively see whether Dragon's Dogma 2 is worth your time and money. I'll make it a point to avoid any major spoilers for those who've yet to complete the game. Given the air surrounding Dragon's Dogma 2, it's important we get the negatives out of the way first, before we start extolling its many virtues. The microtransactions quite simply did not need to exist. All the items one can purchase are attainable in-game, at a rate of progress that's entirely consistent with the game world. Nothing was vaulted simply so that those items could later be sold to players, it's just that some publishing exec likely thought it a good opportunity to sucker players into purchasing things they simply didn't need and, as a result, left a bad air around the game which quite simply didn't need to be there. The upside, however, is that you don't need to purchase any of them. You can buy the core game and enjoy all of its contents for that one-shot purchase. The performance issues are dire, to say the least. I played the game on something resembling a supercomputer, 16 CPU cores, 64GB of RAM and an RTX 4090, yet the most my system could muster in the capital city was an FPS in the 30 range. That's beyond unacceptable, console port or otherwise. Yet, the true shame is that these two factors overshadowed what is otherwise a rich character RPG experience with an awesome combat loop, a bunch of very fun classes players can choose from at will, and the sort of high-concept, lore-heavy, flowery story that one almost comes to expect from a Japanese game these days. Dragon's Dogma 2 places you as the Arisen, the newest in a long line of protagonists, fated to face the dragon, which serves as the world's antagonist. The lore is that in order to stave off the entropic forces of oblivion, a great power once created the dragon, a being singularly capable of saving off the destruction of all things, and hence allowing the cycle of the world to persist. Yet, in order to check the dragon's power, the Arisen too was created. The dragon must nominate a champion who is then fated to slay it. This is where you step in. Bearing the charge of the Arisen with a convenient bout of amnesia to boot, you begin in a forced labor camp, which is where your story unfolds. This is also where you get the first glimpse into the game's awesome boss combat, being very reminiscent of the Monster Hunter series. You're essentially scaling giant building-sized enemies, looking for weak spots to stick your pointy things into. The cool thing is that each class, or vocation as the game calls it, has a profoundly different way of handling these fights. Your standard fighter or thief will likely be climbing all over the boss, hacking away. Meanwhile, your archers and sorcerers will be nuking it from the rear. The warrior will be charging up massive burst attacks using its gigantic two-handed weapons, hoping for that one connection to a weak spot that will delete half the boss's HP bar. 
Meanwhile, my personal favorite, the Magic Archer, will simply allow Magic to hone in their attacks on the boss's weakest spots from afar. The combat, and boss combat in particular, is definitely the highlight of Dragon's Dogma 2. Every time I hear the roars from afar as a gigantic boss HP bar shows up across the top of my screen, I get genuinely excited all over again because I know a memorable experience is about to unfold. Beware, a Minotaur is coming. I have lost count of the amount of ogres, minotaurs, cyclops, drakes, and even dragons I've taken out at this point, but it doesn't matter, because if anything, it's even more fun now than it was at the start, since I know how these monsters ought to be fought. The game world feels positively alive. Many a time while exploring, I've stumbled upon scenes like a pack of wolves fighting a lesser dragon. Over here! Or random pawns in combat with groups of enemies and elites. The developers have skirted the issue of the dreaded static single player world by allowing pawns to roam the landscape and essentially engage in combat much like you would. All over the world, you will see groups interacting like this, whether it be merchant caravans under attack by goblins or various skirmishes of all kinds. It isn't just player versus world, but rather what feels like a dynamic, breathing game world that continues its ebb and flow whether or not the player participates. The story takes you through the game world, from the northern kingdom of Vermund through to the sprawling desert canyons of Batal, and finally to the volcanic wastes where the game both begins and ends. Fortunately, Dragon's Dogma 2 is a beautiful game which helps to offset that so much of it will be played at meager frame rates. The Kingdom of Amund is lush and mountainous, with a dynamic day-night cycle that not only affects quests and NPC locations, but also the sort of monsters that spawn in any given area. Batal, meanwhile, is dry, desolate and open, with its orange-hued landscape stretching for miles. And the volcanic isles spark a visage resembling that of the island of Hawaii with rich vegetation and epic elevations. You navigate these with a party of four, your player character, and three NPCs the game affectionately refers to as pawns. Pawns are the most unique mechanic to Dragon's Dogma 2 and are where the game crosses the border to being a quasi-multiplayer experience. See, your player character and your main pawn are yours to create. You can use the game's borderline insane character creation engine to conjure up just about any appearance you want. I spent hours here before even embarking on any quests. In the broader world, I saw pawns created to look like RPG characters of old or even famous actors. Everything from Chris Hemsworth to Gandalf to Khaleesi and even Zendaya. And that's where this unique aspect really shines. While you create yourself and your main pawn, you then need to supplement your party with two other pawns, which means that you're literally using pawns created by other people playing through the game exactly like yourself. This is done by means of a rift stone, which puts you into a realm between worlds. Pawns have the unique power of traversing between these worlds and hiring their services out to the myriad of arisens which exist between them. It's a nice mechanic which also ties well into the game's overall lore. The practical implication is that you need to create a well-balanced party that can face down any situations. The six main class archetypes are fighter, thief, archer, mage, warrior and sorcerer. Pawns can be any of the six. You, as the Arisen, can further specialise in another four. The game incentivizes you to experiment with all of these for reasons we'll get into shortly. What's interesting is that pawns are created with an inclination, that is, they can be kind-hearted, simple, calm or straightforward. These both change their voice as well as how they interact in combat. For instance, a kind-hearted pawn will sit close by your side, buffing you and aiding you with all manner of curatives the moment you're attacked. Meanwhile, a calm pawn tends to be more strategic and individualistic, focusing on placing themselves in a tactical advantage. What this means in practice is that you want a support mage to be kind-hearted, while a sorcerer who needs to sit in the rear, channeling gigantic nukes, would most benefit from a calm demeanor. Further, they can have a specialization. Some, like logisticians, will literally rearrange the packs of the entire party to ensure an even distribution of weight. Others, like the woodland wordsmiths, are able to translate foreign languages like Elven, which quite literally show up as gibberish on the screen if you don't have them around. <laughs> 
The mechanic is rich and deep, and I could probably talk for hours about all the potential combinations and implications of pawns in the game world, but at a certain point, you just simply have to experience it for yourself. The porn interactions are full of little endearing moments showing meticulous attention to detail, like your pawns high-fiving you after a good battle, You truly are formidable, Arisen. Or recounting how their own master's experience with the quest and its outcome was different to yours. A forgery? Of course! Had my master and I only known... They seem to keep a running memory of the experiences they have in other worlds and report back accordingly. It's a neat touch and an almost unnecessary level of detail, which if nothing else, shows that the people in charge of this were extremely passionate about it. What's interesting is that you're not just trying to craft your main pawn to be useful to yourself, but also useful to others, as it will be on display in a sort of marketplace where you're trying to incentivize other players to use it. You can set quests for those other players as well as rewards, so that if, for instance, you desperately need an item to progress in a quest, those other players can get it for you and then receive the reward you leave for them. I've seen all sorts of craziness here, such as pawns literally named Sphinx's parent in order to help players along in one of the secret side quest chains, but supplemented with abilities players would find useful, to a point where they had several thousands of hearts and upvotes on their pawn. This leads to a tremendous amount of Rift Crystal currency for the owning player, not to mention a ton of experience for said pawn. So there's an incentive to apply creative intelligence and be entrepreneurial in a sense because you're trying to make your pawn stand out in a crowded marketplace. As your pawn travels other worlds, they gain more knowledge about how to take down certain enemies and will call out their weaknesses in combat. We have no means of exploiting our enemy's weakness. If, for instance, the undead are weak to fire damage, your pawn will let you know so that you stop wasting your time trying to whittle them down with ice. They also gain knowledge about how to complete certain quests which you may not have come across yet. In traversing other worlds, I came to know of a treasure chest in this area. A chance you'd like to see it. It's extremely satisfying to get a fetch quest with no location marker, only for one of your pawns to shout, I know where to find this person, master, and then send them on their way rather than stumble around blindly in the wilderness for hours. I can take you to our destination by the optimum route. It's a deep, rich mechanic, and one of the things which makes Dragon's Dogma 2 such a fulfilling experience. The game incentivizes you to try all of its different vocations, since certain passive abilities called augments carry over between them. Certain augments, like a permanent boost to magic resistance, are only available once you've reached a certain level as a mage. Others, like physical resistance, once you've reached a certain level as a fighter. This is true for all 10 character classes that the Arisen can take on, so there's a lot of adventuring and experimentation to be done. Remember how we said The Dragon's Dogma 2 exemplifies both the best and worst characteristics of classic CRPGs? Well, that becomes extremely apparent when we look at the encumbrance and withering mechanics. If a perishable item stays in your inventory for too long, it will eventually rot and become functionally useless. Likewise, if you're the kind of player that picks up everything they see, this will eventually weigh you down so much that you can barely move or fight. So, there is a sort of inventory management side game appended to the main experience. For me, personally, this felt extremely cumbersome, especially toward the end game where you inevitably pick up so much stuff and have no idea of knowing which has utilities to take with you or leave behind in the stash. You fight a lot better with low encumbrance, so the game really incentivizes you to be efficient with your inventory, meaning that you're constantly playing this spreadsheet minigame in between the far more satisfying aspects of climbing all over a cyclops and stabbing it repeatedly in the eye. Travel in Dragon's Dogma 2 is essentially its own character. Dispensing with fast travel in the traditional sense, it offers you three ways to cover the world map. You can literally just hoof it on foot or travel by ox cart, which is a quasi fast travel way of getting between major hub towns, but with the chance of being ambushed. The problem with ambushes is that, oh so often, gigantic monsters and my own overzealous sorcerer turn the ox cart into splinters. When this happens, you're going on foot the rest of the way, and often, while you're in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night to boot. The third, most expensive and most convenient way to travel is via Port Crystal and Fairy Stone. Essentially, there are a handful of these permanent Port Crystals around the game world. You also find smaller portable ones which can be carried around and dropped wherever you like. You then use disposable items called Fairy Stones to one-shot teleport to them in an instant. Sounds like fast travel, right? Well, it is, until you consider that fairy stones are exceedingly rare and expensive. 
at least until the post-game section. So your travel in Dragon's Dogma 2 has to be very deliberate and efficient. You're often batching a few quests at a time to make sure you avoid any unnecessary back and forth travel. Like Dragon's Dogma 2 Greater, it's both good and bad because it makes you appreciate travel and distance, but it can be cumbersome waiting on the ox carts or trying to collect fairy stones for any big expeditions. There's a lot of waiting on cutscenes and for screens to slowly fade to black. After 100 hours, I can say that the game doesn't hold much new to experience beyond this point. Most of the quests you miss on your initial playthrough or the variants you don't experience can be filled in on the first new game plus. So it all really depends on how much you enjoy the massive grind to the level cap, which you definitely won't get anywhere near on your first playthrough. From a storyline perspective, there are several threads which don't get a satisfying conclusion. There are key characters which just flounder away into irrelevancy as the plot seems to move on without them. It takes away some of the gravitas of the story because none of the antagonists really have any persistent weight. They just seem like momentary obstacles for you to overcome in your journey toward the final inevitable showdown with the dragon. So, with all this said and 100 hours down, is Dragon's Dogma 2 a game that's worth your time? Well, that solely depends on what your prime movers are with gaming. If you absolutely must have an experience which elegantly ties off all its story threads and moves seamlessly, then this game is definitely not for you. If, however, you enjoy exploring a rich game world and going off the beaten path, using a ton of vocations which allow you to express yourself in myriad ways in some really intense, well-constructed combat encounters, then it definitely is for you. After a while, I found myself not even caring about the poor performance because I was so engrossed in the exploration and trying to find more efficient ways to fell larger enemies. This scales all the way up until the end, and depending on how much you enjoy it, can actually scale to several New Game Plus playthroughs. For most people, however, they will likely call it a day after the first playthrough, which can take anywhere around 60 hours or more, depending on the amount of exploration and side questing. But let me know what your own experiences with Dragon's Dogma 2 were like, and I'll see you next time.